Currently, a staggering 1.3 billion people are still without electricity. Most of them live in rural areas where there is no power grid available. This is when off-grid PV systems can provide an amazing solution. But for an off-grid system, one more valuable component is required other than the PV modules and an inverter. Battery storage. In case of PV systems, the intermittency of the source is of two kinds. Diurnal fluctuations, which is the difference of irradiance during a 24-hour period, and the seasonal fluctuations, which are the differences of irradiance across the summer and winter months. In this graph, you can see an, an example of the daily intermittency. A typical solar irradiance profile is shown during the day. You can also see the load demand, which is significant in the parts of the day where there is no sun. In a standalone system without storage, even though the sun has more than enough power during the day, the system fails to utilize this excess energy to power the loads when the solar power isn't enough. With the introduction of the battery storage in the PV system, the excess energy from the sun during the day can be stored in the battery. The battery can then be discharged during periods of low solar irradiance and thus the load demand can be met. There are several technological options to fulfill the storage requirements. How do we make an optimal choice for the storage system? Currently, the most useful storage option for PV system application is battery storage. Batteries are electrochemical devices that convert chemical energy into electrical energy. They are mainly classified as primary or secondary batteries. Primary batteries irreversibly convert chemical energy to electrical energy. Examples include the zinc carbon batteries and the alkaline batteries. Secondary batteries, or as they are more commonly called rechargeable batteries, reversibly convert chemical energy to electrical energy. That is, they can recharge when the chemical reaction is reversed using an overpotential. In other words, the excess electrical energy is stored in these secondary batteries in the form of chemical energy. Examples include a lead acid battery and the lithium ion battery. It is the secondary batteries that we are interested in to explore as a possible storage option. There are several kinds of secondary battery technologies available that could be used. For example, lead acid batteries. These are the oldest and the most mature battery technology available till date. I will go deeper into this widely accepted PV storage option later. Another option are the lithium ions and the lithium ion polymer batteries. These are being heavily researched currently as storage alternatives in various applications. Their high energy density has already made them a favorite in lightweight storage applications. But if it wasn't for their cost and low maturity, they would have been instant favorites for storage in PV systems. Note that you shouldn't confuse lithium batteries with with, with lithium ion or lithium ion polymer batteries. Lithium batteries are disposable primary batteries, while lithium ion and lithium ion polymer are secondary batteries. Due to the unbeatable maturity and low cost of the lead acid batteries, they are still the storage technology of choice in PV systems, despite their much lower energy density and relatively low cycle life. Let's look a little more closely at the lead acid battery and some of its characteristics. What do battery specifications such as the rated voltage, the capacity, the state of charge and depth of discharge mean? Well, 
we first start with the voltage and capacity ratings of the battery. Every battery is rated with a certain voltage and capacity. The battery rated voltage is the nominal voltage at which the battery is supposed to operate. The so-called solar batteries or lead acid grid plate batteries are usually rated at 12 volts, 24 volts or 48 volts. Of course, the battery bank in your PV system can attain any voltage based on the interconnection of several batteries at the system level. The term capacity in refers to the amount of charge that the battery can deliver at the rated voltage. The capacity is directly proportional to the amount of electric material in the battery. This explains why a small cell has less a capacity than a large based on the same chemistry, even though the open circuit voltage across the cell will be the same for both cells. Thus, the voltage of the cell is more the chemistry based while the capacity is more dependent on the quantity of the active materials used. The unit for measuring the battery capacity is ampere hour or amp hour, denoted as AH. It's good to recollect from high school physics that the amount of charge is usually measured in coulombs, as the electric current is defined as the flow rate of electrical charge, the charge can also be measured in amp hours. Therefore, we can quantify charge in both coulombs or amp hours. But we will stick to the more convenient unit of amp hours for measuring the battery capacity. I will shortly explain the reason for this. We must not confuse the battery capacity with the energy capacity. The energy capacity of a battery, or any storage device for that matter, is the total amount of energy that the device can store. This is usually measured in watt-hours. How do we calculate the energy capacity of the battery, knowing the voltage and the battery capacity? The energy capacity is nothing but the battery capacity in amp-hours, C, multiplied by the rated battery voltage in volts, giving the total battery energy capacity in watt-hours. You must be wondering what the significance is of amp hours as the unit of battery capacity. The unit itself gives us some important clues about the battery properties. If we take a brand new battery with 10 amp, 10 amp hours capacity, it can theoretically deliver a 1 amp current for 10 hours at room temperature. Of course, in practice this is seldom the case due to several factors, as we will see now. Like every other component in the PV system, the efficiency of storage is also of high importance. Usually, for storage technologies, we talk about round-trip efficiencies. In simple terms, it is the ratio of total storage system input to the total storage system output. For example, if, ten if 10 kilowatt is pumped into the storage system while charging, and you can effectively retrieve only 8 kilowatt while discharging, then the round trip efficiency of the storage system is 80%. The round trip efficiency can be broken down and studied further. The batteries are known to have two kinds of efficiencies. First, there is the voltaic sorry, first there is the voltaic efficiency. This is the ratio of the average discharge voltage to the average charging voltage. This stems from the fact that the charging voltage is always a little above the rated voltage, so as to drive the reverse chemical reaction in the battery. Then we have the Coulombic efficiency. This is defined as the ratio of the total charge from the battery to the total charge into the battery of a full charge cycle. Battery efficiency is defined as the product of these two efficiencies. This overall battery efficiency can be seen as the round trip storage efficiency that is usually considered while comparing different storage devices. This battery efficiency includes the effects of all the chemical and electrical non-idealities that occur in the battery. Now let's look at another important battery parameter the state of charge or the SOC. 
This is defined as the percentage of the battery capacity available for discharge. There's a 10 amp hours rated battery that has been drained by 2 amp hours has a state of charge of 80%. Then we also have the depth of discharge or DOD. Depth of discharge is defined as the percentage of the battery capacity that has been discharged. For example, the same 10, 10 amp hours battery that has been drained by 2 amp hours has a depth of discharge of 20%. Thus the depth of discharge and the state of charge can be seen as complementary to each other. Now we come to a very important parameter, the cycle lifetime of the battery. Cycle lifetime is defined as the number of charging and discharging cycles after which the battery capacity drops below 80% of the nominal value. Usually the cycle life is specified as an absolute number, but it would be a gross generalization to say that the battery lifetime can be stated as a single number without any other specification. Why? It's because the various battery parameters discussed so far are related not only to each other, but are also dependent on temperature. Let us discuss this interesting interplay of battery parameters. Now the cycle life depends heavily on the depth of discharge and the temperature. This can be seen in the graph shown here for a typical maintenance free lead acid solar battery. Clearly the battery lasts longer under colder temperatures of operation. Furthermore, for a particular temperature, cycle lifetime depends non-linearly on the depth of discharge. The smaller the depth of discharge, the higher the cycle life. However, such a higher cycle life would also mean that those additional cycles you gain can only help you for a smaller depth of discharge. Thus, it could be said that the battery will last longer if the average depth of discharge could be reduced over its normal operation. To summarize, we have seen the different kinds of battery technologies and discussed why lead acid is the battery of choice for most current PV systems. Also we have discussed quite some details about specifications and characteristics of batteries. Let's see if you can also do some basic battery calculations with the following exercises, getting you yet another step closer to being able to make your own basic PV design.